Hello everyone, sorry about the late start here. For someone like me that's somewhat tech savvy, um, I guess I still have a hard time getting in with Facebook, which is, they make things these things more complicated every day it seems like, but um, I'm just gonna give a minute to let those um, that wanna participate and join in with us um, get here. Um, Thank you all for joining me on a Saturday morning. I'm going to try to log in here and see if anybody is. Looks like a few are live here. Go. Clearly need to work on my tech savviness to um, make sure everything is working all right before I go live here. But uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Eric Ely. I'm the owner founder of Well Life Family Medicine uh, here in Amarillo. Um, I'm also an assistant professor over at Texas Tech and help teach over there. Uh, you know, this morning. Um, and so as people start tuning in, of course, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, but this morning I'm going to be talking about veins. Uh, March is DVT Awareness Month. And so because of that, I just wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about um, vein care. And so whether we talk about the DVTs, the more deep system, the healthier system that we want to focus on that can be more life-threatening, and also the superficial system. And so... You know, when we start talking about DVTs, you know, the clots, most people are maybe aware of those. I'm not sure if any of you that may be tuning in have had a DVT before or know someone that's had a DVT. They're also called, called in the medical world venous thromboembolism, so VTE for short. You know, in the U.S., there's over 900,000 people that can be affected each year by, uh, you know, DVTs, these venous thromboemboli. And um, pulmonary emboli, a clot in the lungs, is also part of that category. And so we estimate that 60 to 100,000 Americans die of DVT and PE um, every year. And that, you know, unfortunately, up to a quarter of the, the people that have um, a pulmonary emboli, sudden death is the first symptom they have. So it's very acute onset. And that, um, you know, again, the people that do have DVTs, up to a third or, up to, or even up to a half can have long-term complications, what they call post-thrombotic syndrome. And so that can lead to swelling, pain, discoloration, and all kinds of issues after the fact. Um, we talk about, of course, again, once you've had one, there's an increased risk for a second one within the next 10 years. Up to about a third of people can have a second one. And that, of course, as we age, um, that the increased risk goes up. Uh, those over 70 years or older have um, you know, over 60% events are related to uh, age there. And so in general, that one to two people per 1,000 um, is the general uh, overall incidence, and then uh, can rise up to eight per 100,000 in people older than 85. And so it's a, it's a huge problem, and it, it's a problem that many people aren't aware of. So again, just trying to increase awareness for March for DVT Awareness Month. Um, and so it's, of course, worldwide, um, you know, 900,000 events, um, you know, non-fatal, of course, DVTs and PEs, but there are a percentage that are fatal. And so just obviously it's um, something that we can potentially prevent and want to uh, look at preventing there. Um, in Europe, you know, and so obviously people know about breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, you know, and again, there's a lot of awareness that, that goes with these different conditions. Um, but yet when we start talking about uh, DVTs and PEs, the significant risk and um, you know, compared to these other diseases, it kind of blows it out of the water. And so it's definitely something we should be aware of. And it's something that can be prevented for most people. And so, um, you know, these are fairly easy to somewhat prevent. Um, but we just have to take, um, you know, the awareness and take precautions. For those that have um, a DVT, um, of course, again, it depends on if it's provoked from surgery or other factors there. Um, you know, and so when we look at the uh, year out or even two years out, if it's provoked from something, the risk is, is fairly small, especially if it's from surgery. 
Um, you know, again, but if it's something that we don't know <clears throat> that it was, you know, kind of unprovoked, um, like from not from trauma or from those kind of things, uh, then the rate significantly goes up. And so when we talk about the deep system <clears throat> with DVTs, you know, 70 to 80% of DVTs, uh, we're more focused on the, the proximal, the, the ones that are higher up in the thigh. Um, you know, there are 20 to 30% of the DVTs are just isolated down in the, the lower leg and the calf. You know, those probably go unrecognized just because those aren't as dangerous and, and people just focus on um, from popliteal vein up. So from kind of the knee up, because again, those are the, the higher risk ones. But, um, you know, again, it's um, definitely underdiagnosed, under aware of condition there. When we talk about DVTs, there's kind of three factors that play into it. And so we talk about Ver Virchow's triad. That's what we learned in medical school. And we start, so we talk about the hypercoagulability, the endothelial injury, and then the stasis of, of venous blood flow that these factors um, contribute to those DVTs. And so if we can just even affect one of those different factors, it can have a big impact on causing uh, the DVTs. And so, you know, again, of course, um, when we start looking at risk factors, the so type or duration of surgery, you know, that some of the orthopedic surgeries have a very high risk. Of course, that's why they they do prophylactic treatments of different blood thinners to try to help reduce those risks. Of course, depending on what type of anesthesia, if someone was to have congestive heart failure and again, not being able to uh, you know, pump blood adequately back into their heart, um, you know, again, multiple traumas. If they've had a previous uh, clot, if they have varicose veins, we'll talk a little bit about that as well, more in the superficial system. Again, like I mentioned, um, the vast majority of DVTs happen as we get older. Um, being overweight and obese is definitely a risk factor. Um, of course, prolonged bed rest or immobilization. Um, you know, we talk about uh, hormones, and so I've definitely, um, in residency, I, I admitted several uh, teenagers that had pulmonary emboli clots in the lungs from birth control. And so the risk is definitely there. Um, also, that risk is, happens with oral uh, hormone replacement. You know, at our practice, we definitely focus and offer ho hormone replacement options, but we, we want to make sure we're doing it transdermally um, so it's, there's no increased risk for clots when we do it transdermal versus oral has to pass through the liver, and that's what increases the risk. You know, there are certain things we just can't avoid. You know, again, our, our genes and, and what we inherit from family um, but just because we have those genetic risk factors, you know, genes load the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the, tr the, the trigger there. And so we can modify the expression of these genes. You know, certain genes have certain penetrance or expression. And so again, we can kind of change the expression of some of those genes by how we live. Um, and of course the acquired things, most of those things can be, um, modified and, um, uh, uh, potentially, um, trying to prevent or minimize our risk. And of course, if we're aware of these risks, then we can, we can of course, modify our risk by doing certain things um, to, again, just being proactive and keeping us from developing DVTs or PEs. You know, and so when we look at some of the risk, relative risk um, increase, of course, obviously, um, so hyperhomocysteinemia, we check this marker often uh, for patients. Um, typically, this is from an MTHFR gene defect. The, six C, the C677T is the one that's more cardiovascular related. And so that increases your risk a little bit, 2.5% or, you know, or relative to a normal person. Um, you know, and then as we go up, of course, oral contraceptives four times. And then factor five Leiden, if you're homozygous, meaning from both parents versus heterozygous, you know, meaning you got one copy, um, that, that's one of the biggest risk factors as far as genetics go. Um, of course, even the incidence of that per percent per year is pretty small, but again, it does add up. And of course, again, if you have a family history of any kind of clotting disorder, um, definitely being aware of that and trying to uh, take steps to uh, do that. You know, genes are, are very interesting. And again, I think that's a new and evolving field that um, is being underutilized, that it's, I think it's the future of medicine. And if we can be more proactive and personalized um, with medicine. You know, there are definitely different resources for genetic testing. You know, we can do it through just traditional lab testing, but it tends to be pretty expensive. You know, this day and age, of course, there's lots of different access to 
uh, over-the-counter testing through um, 23andMe and other things. And they, they look at some of these risk factors. And so the factor V Leiden gene, um, you know, and then you can plug into your, your uh, 23andMe data, the raw data, into other outside sources like LiveWello. And you can find out all kinds of information, some things you may, may want to know, some things you may not want to know. Um, and so that can show increased risk for, for DVTs and, and clotting there. You know, and then also we can look at functional testing. And so um, people may be taking aspirin, they may be taking Plavix, they may be taking different medicines. And, the, you know, the question is, are they working for you? Why take a medicine if it's not working for you? And, and we want to try to, um, you know, obviously we're taking it for a reason to try to decrease your risk. There's a, um, you know, different test for aspirin resistance to see, you know, if the expression of the genes uh, may be causing some issues. And so sometimes we have to increase the dose um, to get still that uh, efficacy from if we're trying to use aspirin as a uh, antiplatelet therapy. Um, you know, and so again, there are um, our testing we can do genetically as well to kind of see, you know, if you're a carrier for this gene. But again, there's um, different um, expressions of that gene. And so depending on the person, um, it may not be fully expressed. But keep in mind, again, like I said, that genes load the gun, it's environment that pulls the trigger, and so that up to 50% of the thrombotic events in patients with any kind of in, in, inherited kind of thrombophilia, you have to have an acquired risk factor. So whether it's surgery or prolonged bed rest, pregnancy, oral birth control, whatever. And so that, that's what really kind of um, triggers the event. When we talk about surgery, so that's one of the main um, you know, known risk factors for clotting. And so, uh, you know, for someone that's low risk, so someone aged 40 years or younger, the risk of a, of a calf DVT is 2%. Um, proximal, again, DVT, those are the higher risk ones, 0.4%. So pretty low risk there. As we go get older or increase our risk, um, you know, 40 to 60 year olds with no additional risk factors, the risk goes up to 10 to 20% for calf DVTs and then 2 to 4% for proximal DVTs, which again can be more uh, life-threatening can cause, can mobilize and cause the pulmonary emboli, again, those clots in the lungs. Um, and then again, of course, surgery uh, in patients older than 60 years old uh, are considered more higher risk. And that's again where we, you know, we start looking at how do we uh, decrease that risk by using prophylactic, you know, blood thinners um, during around the surgery time, usually about 30, 30 days out from surgery. Uh, because again, that risk of, of clotting goes up significantly, 20 to 40% risk of DVTs, 4 to 8% in those proximal DVTs, and up to 2 to 4% of uh, that pulmonary emboli. And then the highest risk, again, of course, would be um, those that are doing uh, hip or knee, arthroplasty, hip fracture surgery, major trauma, spinal cord injury, uh, and that's getting risk uh, up to 40 to 80% risk of uh, the um, distal DVTs, you know, the ones down in the calves versus the proximal up in the thighs are 10 to 20 percent. Um, and so those risk factors are huge. So again, just trying to modify those risks. Surgeons know about this. So again, they, they, they'll put you on potentially blood thinners. But, um, you know, again, there can be different dosing for different people. Again, if, of course, knowing other risk factors going into the surgery and just trying to modify those risks accordingly. You know, flights are a big topic, and of course, that's another um, risk that when anytime we take a flight, I know, you know, getting crammed in those um, seats can, I, my calves start hurting a little bit um, on a three or four hour flight, you know, there's just not much space to, to spread your legs. So ideally, of course, if you can get up um, kind of every hour, just spend a couple minutes, um, you know, walking to the bathroom and back or whatnot, but up to four to 10 percent of, of people on a flight that's over seven hours can get a DVT um, and or, you know, leg swelling. And so that's pretty significant, one in 10 people. And so that, that's, um, you know, three to 5% of people admitted um, over to Nar Narita for flight related DVTs die from complications. That's, you know, again, these are potentially preventable uh, deaths, um, you know, over in London, you know, Heathrow, you know, they get about one death per month associated with DVT. And um, so it's, it's a real deal and, and something to pay attention to. Um, again, over near to Tokyo, um, you know, between 100 and 150 episodes of DVT uh, every year from, from a long flight. So, of course, to 
lighten the mood there. Laughter is the best uh, medicine. Look, a letter from my doctor. I have to wear tights to prevent DVT when flying at 30,000 feet. So what's your excuse? And so we, we do see that compression stockings can help prevent, um, you know, clots um, pretty significantly. You know, three um, that wore stockings still got um, a, uh, now this was actually symptomless DVT. So again, they're, they're actually doing before and after, um, you know, ultrasounds to kind of compare versus 47 that were not wearing compression stockings. So that's a pretty significant drop from 47 down to three. Um, you know, and of course we talk about the deep DVTs versus just the, the superficial vein thrombosis, SVTs, you know, um, uh, you know, four out of the 16 individuals um, that were wearing stockings versus 12 of them uh, out of the 16 that were not wearing stockings. So again, pretty significant drop um, in risk if you can just wear some compression stockings up to your knee high. Um, ideally medium compression, um, you know, again, there are different compressions when we start talking about compression socks. Um, and so again, that uh, can be helpful there. There's also something to keep in mind that, you know, just activity-based. So we tend to be more active in the summertime, it's warmer outside um, and a little less active in the wintertime. And so we do see that there's a seasonal trend for DVTs and PEs. And so again, you know, staying active even in the wintertime, finding something to do inside, whether it's, you know, on a treadmill or, you know, going to a gym and working out or playing tennis or, you know, whatever inside, you got to stay active year round. And so, um, Another thing to talk about in this day and age is post-COVID that, um, you know, one of the risk factors um, with DVTs is, is now COVID. Whether you get the vaccine or just get COVID naturally, there's definitely been shown increased risk of clotting in the first couple of weeks after COVID uh, um, and, you know, can even last up to about three months. Um, eventually, the, you know, that risk should go back down to more normal. But there are people that are having more long COVID syndromes and, you know, just staying a little more inflamed. And so, you know, they're 36 percent fold or 36 times more increased risk for getting a PE in the first week and 46 times more higher risk in the second week. And um, overall, DVTs were about 5 percent or five fold, excuse me, five times higher um, than uh, in the first month. Um, and so it's actually interesting that we're, of course, we, we catch more um, PEs. Those are um, more life-threatening. Of course, we're doing um, CT chests. And so it's probably more that um, we're finding them more than, uh, you know, there are probably more uh, DVTs that are happening as well. We're just not looking for the, in the calves as much because they're, they may be asymptomatic. But the bottom line is, is there's definitely an increased risk for clotting uh, with COVID that we have to keep in mind, uh, especially. Now, not, not every leg swelling is, of course, a DVT, and so um, for those that were negative for a DVT, you know, a vast percentage of them were just muscle strains, so the 40%, um, you know, 7% were from venous insufficiency, well, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, maybe a Baker cyst in the back of the knee, um, you know, and some other abnormality, you know, up to 26% that we, it wasn't identified, but um, the vast majority tend to be more just from muscle strain. One thing to talk about just um, anatomically, some people have a variation, uh, Maytherner uh, syndrome is where the left common iliac uh, vein is compressed by the right common iliac artery. And so we may see a little more left leg swelling. And so if someone has more left leg predominant swelling than right leg, this is something to think about and um, something may, may be addressed. Now, may need a little bit of a stent in a deeper system to kind of prevent that collapse and you know we definitely see this in, in practice. So um, not common, but it does happen and something to think about for sure. And you know, so when you're trying to take steps to prevent DVTs, if you're going on a long flight, um, of course the compression stockings like I mentioned, but there are a few different supplements that have been shown to be beneficial. And um, so pycnogenol is one of those. Um, now this was, um, you know, again, uh, taking 100 milligrams. Now they took 200 milligrams uh, two to three hours prior and then another two, um, 200 milligrams uh, six hours later, and then 100 milligrams uh, the day uh, after that. Uh, and so we did see definitely a drop just with doing um, the uh, uh, um, uh, pycnogenol by itself. And so they did still have one non-thrombotic event, kind of a localized phlebitis, um, compared to five thrombotic events um, 
one DVT and four superficial thrombosis in the control group. And, um, you know, and so that by itself, natokinase is another one. And so that's been shown to break down fibrin. Um, and so that's part of the kind of clotting cascade and precursor to fibrinogen. And so um, we start talking about uh, looking at the combination of both of those with pycnogenol and natokinase that um, they showed seven thrombotic events in the control group, five DVTs, two superficial thrombos, thrombo, um, emboli there. Um, and so that was 7.6% out of the 92 patients. This is a small study, but there was zero ev ev um, events in the group that was taking the combined pycnogenol and natokinase. So it also interestingly, of course, you know, um, swelling, of course, is showing increased risk for those just in the control group. But those that took the, the com combined pycnogenol and natokinase actually showed a 15% decrease um, uh, incidence of swelling in, um, uh, after taking it. And so um, fish oils are also another thing that we talk about. And so we frequently will check an omega-3 level uh, in patients. We try to get above 5.5. There's, there's been shown to be an 80% reduction in heart attacks and sudden death when taking or when getting a level up to that amount. Of course, ideally through the diet, you know, chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, um, of course, seafood, but um, obviously Amarillo is not the hot spot for seafood, so taking some fish oil supplements can be helpful. And so we, we definitely see an in, or a, a decreased incidence of pulmonary envi, DVTs, um, when taking omega-3s. One of the biggest things that I wanted to talk about actually today was just um, increasing our fitness level. You know, we do VO2 max testing in the office. And so again, we talked about the kind of that seasonal variation in uh, clotting that we see during the winter time, a lot higher incidence, but um, we can look at, and of course, even, you know, looking prior to surgery, uh, those that were mo more active and that have better cardiovascular health showed better outcomes. And even just going from, you know, kind of a, a low um, cardiovascular health to um, less than average showed a significant drop in, in mortality, cause of death. Um, but again, so cardiovascular fitness is one of the best, um, more, most powerful predictors of mortality. Um, and so again, if we can just um, each one met higher, um, which again, a met is just kind of a, it's a, a measurement, it's a metabolic equivalent of, depending on what exercise activity you're doing, when we do the VO2 max testing, it's equivalent to a point or 3.5 um, milliliters per kilogram. And so, you know, again, uh, going from say 15 to um, 18.5 on your VO2 max testing um, drops or improves your survival by 10 to 25%. That's huge. That's more powerful than medicines. Um, you know, exercise is our best medicine. Nutrition and food is our best medicines. We just don't focus on them enough. And it's, we just don't realize how powerful they are. These things that, you know, those God-given things that we have, we just, again, um, just don't take advantage of them. And so, again, those with the, the lowest, you know, cardiovascular fitness had a 70% and 56% higher risk of all-cause mortality. Um, you know, and again, a 13 to 15% reduction for just a one met increase. That is a small uh, increase having big... Um, a big impact there. And so um, when we're looking at surgical clearance, again, 18% of patients with the VO2 max of less than 11 um, died of vascular causes. That's, you know, that's, that's crazy. One in five people versus as long as you get above that threshold, the mortality rate was less than 1%. So again, just, you know, if you're thinking about surgery and, and you're trying to decrease your risk, trying to be proactive and, and being active before um, surgery can significantly decrease your risk. Um, of course, what do we recommend for exercise? Of course, you know, more than five days a week of moderate exercise or greater than th uh, more than three times a week of more vigorous exercise. Um, of course, a combination of both obviously is great. Um, you know, the American Heart Association actually recommends that once a year that, you know, the cardio respiratory fitness should be estimated at least. Um, you know, and ideally, of course, again, if we can measure it and know where it's at, but, you know, I wonder how many, uh, you know, that are watching know what their VO2 max is, you know, where, where would you, you know, be fall on this uh, spectrum? 
And again, it's such so powerful. It's crazy how much how powerful just even raising it just a little bit. And it doesn't take much to raise um, your VO2 max if you can start being a little more active. Um, you know, and so kind of switching over, we, we talked a little bit about the deep system with, with DVTs, but, um, you know, chronic venous disease, talking about more varicose veins, superficial disease also increases the risk of, of DVTs. And so DVTs um, are associated with that, and you know, there's about a five-fold more likely to have valvular reflux um, uh, than in the control group. And on the other hand, when we look, um, looking at people that with varicose veins, it's kind of the same thing. So, you know... Chick, you know, tomato, tomato there, or chicken or the egg, I don't know. Um, but when we look over about eight years, you know, seven and a half years, that the, the group with the varicose veins had about a five-fold increased risk for DVTs. And then the people that had DVTs, when we go back and look at that, they had a five-fold um, increased risk for having varicose veins. So there's definitely an association there. Um, and we see that, you know, 1 in 22, or about 4.5% of uh, the population are affected by varicose veins, and that you know over forty percent of women in their fifties are suffering from some kind of venous disorder. So, um, a, you know, about sixty percent of Americans suffer from uh, varicose veins and venous insufficiency. And there's a whole kind of spectrum, of course. You know, starting from spider veins, which we talk about telangiectasias, um, versus varicose veins, versus you know we start getting some some changes of the skin. So we call it lipodermatosclerosis. Uh, of course, it can then even end up uh, with ulceration. And so you may have um, aching, you know, fatigue, heaviness in the legs, some pain, you know, throbbing, um, cramping, swelling, itching, restless legs, numbness. Um, you know, and it's interesting when we start talking about restless legs, that 98% of people with restless legs, if they get their, their veins treated, have resolution or at least significant improvement of their restless legs. And people that get, um, of course, numbness, you know, more peripheral neuropathy, again, a huge association with, with uh, venous insufficiency and um, neuropathy. And so we talked, again, a little bit about the deep veins. So that's the femoral vein. We start talking about, you know, anterior tibial, posterior tibial veins. The superficial system is the small saphenous vein and then the great saphenous vein. And, you know, those, those veins, um, you know, uh, aren't as really important. They're, those are not the main ones you can you can do without those veins. So if they're unhealthy and they're just causing leaking and pulling of your of your blood, we want to bypass those and use the deeper system, the healthier veins. Now, again, talking about genetics with the DVTs, there's obviously a component of that with the superficial vein disorders there as well. Um, in that, you know, 89 percent. Um, uh, if both parents had varicose veins, um, you know, the risk of developing uh, varicose veins was pretty significant. Um, if, you know, you had a 40% uh, chance if one parent had varicose veins and 20% if neither parent had varicose veins. And so, again, when we start talking about um, what's, you know, the incidence of superficial venous disease, which we, we label between C1 and C6, that's the categories comparing that to something like diabetes or heart disease or cancers, you know, there's, that's, that's a big number, 175 million people. And we talked about this with DVTs as well. Again, comparing that to cancers, huge um, burden on society with, with clotting and, and venous disease that's kind of unaware of. And so again, just that's why I'm doing this talk for March, um, you know, DVT Awareness Month. And, um, we do see, of course, again, with those with genetic issues, it can start in as early as childhood, you know, even as early as 10 to 12 years old, 2.5%. As we do get older, of course, that risk does go up. Um, and again, the, the severity um, of the different diseases, you know, seep 2 again, is where you can actually see varicose veins. seep 3 is where you get some of the swelling. seep 4 is get the skin changes. And seep 6 is the active ulcers. And so, again, another risk factor is women that have had pregnancies, and we see a direct correlation with the more pregnancies, the higher the risk for venous insufficiency. Also, another risk factor is, of course, how often you're standing or in activity. And so, again, you know, that plays a significant uh, role in developing venous um, disease just because, again, those veins, those valves are stressed, you know, the, the longer you're standing. And so trying to give them a little bit of a break 
and uh, trying to get, you know, getting your calf muscles pumping and walking around. Um, and so only 6.3% 6 of jobs allowed frequent walking during their shifts. You know, most of, you know, 64% of people that were working in a factory were standing in one place um, or, you know, about 30% of them were prolonged sitting. So both of those uh, increase the risk. We want to keep those legs moving and uh, again, of course, trying to just get that circulation going. And so we talked a little about the symptoms of venous insufficiency and some of the risk factors. Um, again, that's kind of just refreshing and re reviewing there. And so what are some of the treatment options? Of course, old school, we talk about the vein stripping. Um, you know, that's really not no longer done. Um, and that's maybe some of the people still think about that and kind of the horror. Um, you know, and then unfortunately in medical school, you know, docs aren't really talked about vein disease. Um, it's a, kind of a, a, we can only cover so much obviously in, in medical school and that's just kind of put on the back burner as something that it's not, you know, as um, significant of a disease as other things. But again, the, the incidence and prevalence and the overall uh, effect that we, it has on society is pretty huge actually. Um, phlebectomy is where we again, uh, basically just uh, use a little crochet hook and we're pulling out the vein and just interrupting the vein. Um, you know, sometimes we'll still do this for more of those superficial ones that are just right underneath the skin versus little small ones. Um, but a lot of times we don't need to be doing this. Um, we can use other, other methods to, to help out. And so what's happening with, um, what causes varicose veins is, you know, again, these valves in our legs are just becoming incompetent. They're not working and they're allowing the, the blood to kind of pull and, and go the wrong direction. You know, so they should be going up to, back towards your heart. Um, and again, if they don't close properly, it's gonna allow backwards blood to just kind of pull in the lower legs. And so eventually, again, left untreated, you know, it starts developing you know, the valve damage and it starts remodeling the veins. We start getting capillary leakage. So that's, again, where we start getting more swelling. And again, can start turning into skin changes and capillary damage with venous ulcers. And so that increases basically hypertension in the venous system. You know, we, we are more concerned about hypertension in the arterial system, but you know, hypertension in the venous system is not good as well. And so um, we don't measure that. That's not measured through a blood pressure cuff. Um, you know, and so it's uh, something that kind of goes un, undiagnosed. And so again, as we talked about a little bit of the progression in the different cl classifications of what they call SEEP, um, and that's, again, of course, just talking about the SEEP is an abbreviation for clinical etiology, anatomy, and, and pathophysiology. And it's just the underlying causes of some of the, the different varicose veins and venous uh, issues. And so most commonly, the people that we'll see are either at C2, C3, um, you know, C4. Uh, hopefully, we prevent them from getting an active ulcer. Um, but I can't tell you how often we see people that are admitted to the hospital with... Um, bilateral, both legs, they're talking, they are diagnosed with cellulitis on both legs. That just doesn't happen. Um, I mean, it can happen because, but the reason the underlying cause for it, if it does happen, is venous insufficiency. And they need to get their veins treated. They need to get, you know, again, that's to help resolve their issues. But, um, and again, if you already have pigment changes on the legs, you know, that can get uh, improved with time if you do get the veins treated. But ideally, if we can catch it at a C3 or C2 even, um, most commonly, again, kind of interventions happen more in the C3 territory. Um, we talk about, of course, the severity of, uh, in trying to help gauge when, when should we take actions to try to uh, help the veins. And so this VCSS scoring um, will ask patients questions. Again, of course, how much pain they're having, you know, how, how uh, significant of uh, disease do they have, how many, how many vessels, um, you know, if they have any open ulcers, if they, are they using compression, are they having any pigment changes, those kind of things. But also remember that not everybody has outward appearances of um, venous issues. And so again, you can still have leg pain and your legs look normal, but have, you know, deeper issues going on. So, you know, not everything you can see from the surface. You know, the, the SEEP1, again, these are the spider veins. You know, these aren't as concerning. You know, cosmetically, they can be concerning. And so, you know, we do uh, treat these in the office um, just for more cosmetic reasons. And again, these can be a sign of an underlying uh, problem and kind of a precursor to more concern. So again, a lot of, sometimes we'll screen with an ultrasound to kind of make sure that we're not missing anything deeper because we really need to 
turn off the deeper stuff first before you know worrying about the just the the superficial spider veins as we start getting more of the ropey you know varicose veins again post pregnancy or more genetic causes there um you know again these can be painful and can cause issues for people and um, again may warrant treatment there the swelling and, and of course not all swelling is from varicose veins but uh, and we'll talk, talk a little bit about that but again once you start getting swelling you definitely probably should have an evaluation where what's that cause you know is it heart failure is it um you know again of course lymphedema versus lipedema um, versus venous insufficiency and so you know lymphedema you know again if, if feet are swelling too and of course, the venous insufficiency can lead to some lymphedema because it's just putting more pressure on the venous system. The, the pressure starts building up. Um, but lymphedema, typically, when you push on it, it's not going to pit um, versus you know, venous insufficiency. Uh, you continue to leave those indentions. So if you're wearing socks and you leave sock impressions, then um, you know, that's more venous insufficiency versus uh, lymphedema, um, you know, as again... Uh, kind of a different system, but there are definitely treatments for that as well. And so, you know, lymphedema versus lipedema, you know, lipedema is, is more kind of exclusively females. It's more abnormal fat deposits, usually kind of a family history of, of things there, usually spares the feet um, versus the, the lymphedema does not spare the feet. So again, of course, and again, there these people with lymphedema and lipedema can also have venous insufficiency. So there's overlaps in these things. And so, uh, just have to be aware of those. We talked a little bit about that May Thurner syndrome, which can of course also cause an increased risk for DVTs, but this can cause lymphedema just because again, it's causing that backflow to where we don't uh, get as good drainage there. There's also other um, more hereditary issues um, and of course secondary causes. And again, like I said, venous insufficiency is one of the secondary causes of lymphedema. So by treating the venous insufficiency can help out the lymphedema. And, um, you know, especially if you uh, catch it more early on. Um, there are definitely different uh, compression devices, uh, pneumatic devices uh, that can help kind of pump that blood um, back to the heart and kind of get your legs doing a little better. And, you know, these are uh, more Velcro based. Um, and so it's, there's definitely some different therapies there. Moving on from the C3, the edema, to the C4, again, this is when you start seeing skin color changes. And so if you have a bronzing, a, a darkening of your lower legs, you know, that's, that's venous insufficiency until proven otherwise. And so trying to address that and help deal with that is a, would be an important thing to help prevent, um, you know, DVTs. Like I said, there's a five-fold increased risk for DVTs for those with venous insufficiency. And so it's not just a cosmetic thing by any means. It's definitely a medical issue. Um, C5, you know, is where we get the healed ulcers, and then C6 is an active ulcer, and so again, um, you know, these can be really hard to treat, um, and um, especially again if you don't address the underlying problem. The underlying problem is venous insufficiency, so you have to deal with that um, versus just trying to you know, heal the skin from the outside in. Now there are different um, ways to again close these veins. So RFA is is an ablation. It's radio frequency ablation. That's where we use microwave. It's it's heating up the the vein to kind of to damage it to close it off. Um, you know EVLT is laser treatment. Um, you know and so those are are two popular things. Laser treatment unfortunately does not have a as consistent a treatment option. So. Um, I would say more more doctors are using radio frequency ablation to be very more consistent. Um, they both have pretty good closure rates. Um, and again, when we start looking at even four years out, still has about an 89%, 90% success rate. But ultimately, of course, over time, our veins, um, you know, and again, just being genetics and family history, uh, they can recur or another vein could cause some issues. Uh, Varathena is a foam. Um, it's uh, potentially not quite as effective but it's also less invasive. So instead of having to have multiple pokes up in the groin, um, you know, it can make it a lot more pleasant. It's basically just like getting your blood drawn just down in your leg. Um, Clary vein is an interesting, it's more of a mechanical thing. So people that have a concern about um, chemicals being injected or, you know, the heat and the trauma there, um, Clary vein is another alternative there. And then venous seal is a glue. Um, and so those are some of the, the ways to, um, uh, newer ways instead of the vein stripping like what was done in the olden days. 
You know, there's some interesting studies on thermography. We, we use that mainly for breast thermography, for looking for breast health and in kind of, um, you know, early cancer uh, prevention and detection there. But it can also be used with varicose veins and potentially at some point in, in the future, we will start doing some screenings um, using thermography for, you know, it's cool that you can see underneath the skin surface there and seeing, you know, those varicose veins that aren't visible at the surface. And so um, very uh, sensitive, so 98% uh, accuracy compared to ultrasound. So very accurate and very helpful there. Um, and of course, and it can actually de detect in some things that we may miss when we screen with ultrasound. And so a 24% increased in, um, in clinical re uh, relevant incompetence detection um, by using thermography. There are some different supplements that can be helpful for venous insufficiency. So if you, again, you have swollen, achy, heavy legs, um, not really wanting to do an ablation at um, this point, um, or even post ablation, again, we do see better outcomes. Um, when you do have vein treatments, um, you know, I've had patients that have had um, multiple vein procedures and, you know, of course it kind of can be um, uh, repetition, but then they get started on a supplement like this and it can make big changes in how they feel. And so I like this brand. This is a good company of designs for health, Vessel Forte. You know, I have um, no association with them per se. Um, we do carry this in the office, um, but there's lots of other brands out there. This one has a combination of, of multiple different uh, ingredients that can be helpful for veins. We talked about desmonin um, and so the hesperidin, and we talked about uh, horse chestnut, vitamin C, and just all of those different things that can help support the blood vessel, you know, strength, elasticity, and, um, you know, actually also even decrease the risk for clotting and kind of more of an anti-inflammatory effect. And so, again, of course, in our office, we use a combination of these different therapies, you know, scleroderma therapy for more of the um, cosmetic, um, you know, spider veins. Of course, again, we may use ultrasound for the bigger ones, um, and but usually we can just kind of uh, visibly see those from the surface. We may use the radiofrequency ablation, verathena, again, those, that injectable, it's polydocanol, it's kind of an extract from coconuts, um, and so that's fairly benign or, or fairly um, a low uh, incidence of, of allergies with that, and it's out of your system in about 60 seconds. And then rarely we'll use phlebectomy, but occasionally, again, for big ropey veins that are right close to the surface, that can lead to better cosmetic outcomes quicker if doing that. Um, for those that are interested, um, you can check out emerovaricoseveins.com and um, that can give you a little more information about some of the vein treatments. And, you know, I hope this was helpful. Um, I apologize that I got started a little bit late. I guess I got to figure out more tech stuff with um, uh, Facebook there, but um, I don't see any questions at this point. Um, I again hope this was helpful, and um, uh, stay tuned for next month. Kate is going to be giving a talk on allergies. You know, April allergies, that definitely is a, is a huge uh, issue for a lot of people. We're trying to do kind of a once a month just education on some different topics and something that we can kind of archive and so that people that may be having some issues, they can go back and kind of watch some of these talks and, and um, you know, just stay educated because it's about education not medication and so just the more you can know you know of course knowledge is power and and just trying to empower you with as much wisdom again because ultimately it's your body your choice and we're just trying to guide you in the best decision to make for your health there's not a one size fits all in medicine you know again it's it, different things are important to different people and medicine's definitely not black and white and so we just try to, to give people options and of course that's the same thing with veins is you know, we have different options for different people, for different conditions, for different situations. Um, and again, of course, definitely don't fo force anything on anybody. Um, but we're here for you if you need us. And, um, and again, I hope this was helpful. And thanks for tuning in on a Saturday morning and sharing a few minutes with me. So I am going to uh, end at this point if I don't see any questions in the next minute or so. Um, looks like I've been going for about 45 minutes or, and, um, well, thanks again. I hope y'all have a great weekend and 
we will try to keep helping you all through things. Thanks, Anne, for tuning in. And all right, y'all have a good one. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Dixie. You're welcome.